Welcome! In this webinar, we will look at a different way to approach fundamental physics from what has been taught in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. The different approach is founded upon a return to two old ideas that the classical physicists held, absolute theory and realism. Almost everyone knows who the guy on the front right is. Albert Einstein is on the front right. Many physicists recognize who is in the center. It's Paul Dirac. But how many know who the one is on the front left? It's Hendrik Lorentz. Hendrik Lorentz was a great classical physicist, a giant. Together with Fitzgerald, Larmor, and Poincaré, he developed the, Lo the Lorentz transformations of space and time. The Lorentz force equation also bears his name. However, when I learned modern physics as a sophomore in college, I was only very briefly introduced to Lorentz's ideas before quickly moving on to a complete focus on relativity. When I asked why Einstein was right and Lorentz was wrong, I was told that Lorentz was discredited. But discredited how? It was not by experiment. The picture appearing two slides ago is a snippet of the one shown here which comes from the 5th Solvay Conference held in October 1927. It was the last such conference attended by Lorentz, as he died four months later. In addition to Dirac, Lorentz, and Einstein, the conference also included many, if not most, of the major contributors to quantum mechanics. Schrodinger, Pauli, and Heisenberg appear in the back row, Debye, De Broglie, and Bohr in the middle, and Planck in the front. We'll return to the Solvay Conference in a bit, but first we must go a bit back further in time. A dark age for absolute theory began when relativity was initiated and took root in the years 1905 to 1925. Special relativity was published in 1905, and the general theory was added in 1915, with a focus on the advance of Mercury's perihelion in its orbit. In 1919, Eddington showed experimental agreement with general relativity, and relativity has ruled space-time ever since. And this is what led to the discrediting of Lorentz and his absolute view of space and time, as general relativity had now experimental support. But special relativity and general relativity are different theories. Einstein followed Mach, who followed Hume. Hume emphasized the supremacy of empiricism in obtaining truth. Mach championed positivism that called into question the need for underlying physical models. Empirical observation was all that we could trust, was the claim. Einstein referred to Mach and Hume regularly. Positivism led to mathematics and experiment as the sole ingredients to truth, allowing space and time unification and a totally new way of doing physics. Physical models, such as the ether, were no longer needed. Maxwell's and other equations became the primary entities in physics, while space and time became secondary. Shortly after relativity, quantum mechanics arrived. The Bohr-Sommerfeld model of the hydrogen atom appeared in 1913. Then, a bit later, Schrodinger's equation had remarkable success. However, these treatments were not consistent with relativity. Schrodinger's equation is not covariant and a quantum mechanical description of the two-slit experiment implies an entity with spatial extent collapsing instantaneously in violation of special relativity. It was at the 5th Solvay Conference that the debate between the realists, which included Einstein, and the instrumentalists, led by Bohr, was ended in favor of the instrumentalists. Instrumentalism has triumphed ever since, and a dark age for realism began. Yet, as with the discredited nature of Lorentz, how was the debate over realism ended? The majority ruled, a consensus was obtained, and the science was settled. The debate was never ended by an experiment. By the conclusion of the Fifth Solvay Conference, a dogma was fully established that has now ruled physics for 91 years and counting. Relativity, which displaced absolute theory, is one pillar. Quantum mechanics is the second, and instrumentalism is the third pillar. Instrumentalism displaced realism, although notably, Einstein remained a holdout for realism. 
This dogma was called modern physics, and absolute and realist physics receded from the scene. But modern physics has its problems. While instrumentalism and Einstein's relativity, as well as human mock, are all on solid philosophical ground, and while for the most part the 2018 status quo is consistent with experiment, it can still be argued that a physical reality can also exist. Just because we must give empiricism primacy, and relativity and quantum mechanics agree mostly with experiment, this does not mean that we must abandon our search for an underlying objective physical reality. We may still be able to postulate an underlying objective reality that agrees with the observations we measure, and return to a realist physics. After all, certain nagging problems such as the mysteries of wave-particle duality and quantum entanglement, and the catastrophic failure of the standard model prediction for the cosmological constant, which is off by between 60 and 120 orders of magnitude, stubbornly evade a status quo solution. And then we have the Lagrangian. Modern physics has led us to this, and this, and this. The previous three slides are one description of the single equation that is the Lagrangian of the standard model. Many, many contributions and many, many experiments over time has led to this single glorious equation. And it is all relativistically covariant, unlike Schrodinger's equation. And it does agree with almost all experimental data. Of course it does. It has something over 150 terms but it is tremendously complex. Is nature really that complex? The standard model is more of a, of, of a catalog of our knowledge than it is a physical theory. There is also a very serious problem with present theory. Relativity remains fundamentally incompatible with quantum mechanics. In 1935, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen asked, can quantum mechanics be considered complete? posing a thought experiment confronting quantum mechanics with relativity, as Einstein remained a realist. In 1965, John Stuart Bell refined the EPR argument, and in 1982, Aspect, Delabert, and Roger showed that quantum mechanics was correct. But rather than abandon relativity, we now abandon non-local reality, whatever that means, and we get philosophical about quantum entanglement and the limits of human understanding. In light of the problems which still exist, it may be helpful if we consider a return to the absolute and realist approach to physics. At the outset, it should be admitted by all that relativity and instrumentalism are first and foremost philosophy. Special relativity is just an inter interpretational difference with Lorentz over the same Lorentz transformation equations. Lorentz derived the equations assuming a classical underlying reality, a luminiferous ether, moving rods that shrunk, moving clocks that slowed it down. Einstein derived a space and time that were changing. Lorentz said it is rods and clocks that are changing. But what about general relativity, Eddington, and the observation of gr gravitational lensing and waves? Let's follow Einstein in reverse. By 1905, Poincaré had proposed that there was a relativity evident in nature and it was known that the Lorentz equations could be used to, de to derive a constant speed of light. Einstein then reversed the derivation by working backward from relativity and constant speed of light postulates to derive the Lorentz transformation. We can now accept that the equations of general relativity and work backwards to a postulate that gravity and acceleration affect rods and clocks in a way that leads to those same equations and thus restore the absolute and realist paradigm although other equations are possible as well when we consider a real ether. And there is a crucial difference between relativity and absolute physics. Relativity does not allow instantaneous action at a distance, while absolute physics does. Einsteinian realism demands point-like interactions because of the relativity of simultaneity. Entities having a spatial extent can't have things happen to them simultaneously at internally distant places such as their ends when evaluated in different reference frames.
But the ca but causality requires this if we assume a reality to quantum mechanics. Relativity is a realist point-like theory in four-dimensional space-time without an absolute simultaneity. But quantum mechanics is not a point-like theory. Instrumentalism, otherwise known as the Copenhagen inter interpretation, is just one possible view of quantum mechanical collapse that is consistent with relativity. The many-worlds hypothesis is another. But neither explanation is wholly satisfactory. So could the Lorentz paradigm of an absolute physics be closer to the truth than the dogmas established in 1927? There is no difference in most of the math. The difference is primarily conceptual or philosophical. Instead of a manifest covariance, we can have a well-defined absolute simultaneity, and that leads to a simple answer to, of the quantum mechanics collapse mystery. When non-local simultaneity is allowed, so is an instantaneous collapse of a spatially finite wave function. Einstein's realism is then possible, if we set relativity aside. And we may profit by returning to the classical idea of an underlying physical model in other ways as well. <coughs> At this point, we can define a neoclassical physics paradigm. A neoclassical paradigm will begin by assuming that there is an objective, real existence outside of us. We can attempt to model what that reality is, and then propose experiments to see if our models represent that reality. We will keep a classical concept of absolute space and time, and keep classical realism, and we will add to it quantum mechanics. Space can be defined by three flat Euclidean axes, and time as the independent parameter that orders events and absolute simultaneity can be assumed. The ether is different than space. The ether is a physical object within space. And this idea differs from those of Einstein and Lorentz. But what about quantum mechanics? The neoclassical paradigm departs from the classical paradigm in that quantum mechanics is accepted. Like present dogma, entities are proposed to be represented by wave functions that can undergo quantum collapse from one state to another. But unlike present dogma, the wave function is considered to be real, have a finite extent, and be the square root of the density of the entity, instead of just a probability of where a point-like entity may reside. This dogma is allowed when we adopt an absolute assumption for space and time, overcoming relativity objections, and, a, and achieving a realist quantum mechanics. We can also go on to define a neoclassical quantum collapse law. If an entity's wave function impinges upon the wave function of one or more other entities, it will do one of two things. It will either collapse to a size equal to delta x equals h bar over 2 delta p at a place where a momentum exchange of delta p is required, or it will collapse to the entire region where no momentum exchange is required. The above law captures what happens in experiments in a way that is consistent with a real assumed wave function. Momentum exchange, not observation or instruments, is what causes the collapse. It is a real and physical process. The neoclassical paradigm just introduced allows us to investigate some new physics ideas. In the past two years, four physics articles have appeared on the Infogalactic Online Encyclopedia. They are An Absolute Theory of Space and Time, The ABC Prion Model, A Derivation of Maxwell's Equations from a Two-Component Ether, and An Absolute Quantum Mechanics. The first three began over 20 years ago, while the absolute quantum mechanics effort is new. We'll now take a quick look at each of the works. An Absolute Theory Without a Length Contraction was published in 1994 under the Superconducting Supercollider byline. A talk given at the SSC received minority theorist support at the time. In the paper, it is shown that the Lorentz transformation equations can be derived by a physical time dilation coupled with an assumption that the speed of light is constant. 
No physical length contraction is required. This could be where we are today, as we assume the speed of light is constant and we use the Lorentz transformations for our physics. However, the Michelson-Morley experiment needs an explanation if no length contraction actually exists. To explain the Michelson-Morley null result, it is observed that a mirror enforces a null condition in the electric field. This is similar to holding a string with your fingers and plucking it to set up a standing wave. If you slide your fingers along the string, there will be nodes in the oscillation where you enforce a zero displacement with your fingers, but the oscillation will continue between the nodes. Decomposing that standing wave mathematically results in one wave going forward with c plus v and the other going backward at c minus v, where c is the speed of the unaltered wave on the string. Similarly, mirrors can act to enforce nodes in the electric field, and this leads to the Michelson-Morley null result, because now the speed of light between the mirrors is c. A group velocity equivalent of the Michelson-Morley experiment was therefore proposed. Ultra-short laser pulses can now allow for an amplitude instead of a phase comparison of round-trip light durations, and that might lead to a non-null result. However, we failed to get approval for funding, and as such, the experiment has never been done. I thought this was very odd at the time. Billions of dollars were being proposed for the SSC, but $50,000 was considered too much for a possibly revolutionary test. Later, I realized we could do the test for under $1,000, but the group owning the laser wanted government approval to do it at all. I soon realized that science is not just a quest for truth, it is often also a quest for money. The approval process plays a big role and often a good one on deciding where to spend the scarce funds, but how can we not do that test? The ABC prion model proposes that three elementary particles, the A, B, and C, make up all of matter. Leptons are proposed to be comprised of an anti-A and a B prion, while quarks are proposed to be the bindings of a C prion to either an A prion or a B prion. ABC prions are objects that are proposed to really exist, unlike quarks, where their existence is a bit more nebulous. ABC, the ABC prion model had its origins in the 1980s, with its first publication in 1997. It answers the question about why there are three generations of quarks and leptons, which are simply excited states of the same underlying system. It unifies quarks and leptons with the same substituent particles, the prions, and it reduces the number of elementary forces and particles believed to exist in nature. Here we see the process of beta decay as described by the ABC prion model. A neutron is made up of a central C particle, as well as two B particles and an A particle. Neutrinos are proposed as the binding quanta that hold the prions together. In a quantum tunneling event, a B tunnels out and virtually escapes from the neutron. In that intermediate state, an A anti-A pair is formed as well as a pair of neutrinos. The A then combines with the neutron remnant to form a proton, while the anti-A and a neutrino combine with a B to form the electron and a free neutrino remains. In the ABC prion model, all leptons are various excited states of the anti-A, B, and neutrino system, while quarks are identified as various excited states of the C bindings. All quarks and leptons can be constructed with this identification, and hence all known massive hadrons and leptons can be constructed as well. All weak decays are similar to the beta decay shown here. Hence, the ABC prion model not only greatly reduces the number of particles that we consider to be elementary, but it also reduces the number of forces, as weak decays are seen to actually be simple quantum tunneling events. At this point, a brief mention should be made about the role that neutrinos have in the ABC prion model. Some critics have argued that neutrinos can't be a force carrier because of their half-inger spin, 
which would change bosons to fermions and fermions to bosons at QED-like vertices if the math is similar between QED and what is needed for the neutrino dynamics. However, QED may not apply to a new force, and even if similar math were to be used, it could simply be that the neutrino vertex is first order forbidden in the perturbation series of the new treatment. Other critics have pointed out that neutrinos interact very rarely with matter and question how they could be the, quant the, the binding quanta. Here it is important to realize that the prion masses are 45.6, 34.8, and 67.9 GeV over C squared for the A, B, and C prions respectively. Hence, the binding is extremely tight, since two prions with masses of tens of GeV over C squared combine to form leptons that have masses thousands of times smaller. With such a large binding energy, it is to be expected that only very specific neutrinos with just the right energy will interact with that tightly bound system. Lower energy neutrinos would just not have enough energy to change the state of that system. Therefore, it should not be surprising that the cross-section for interaction is only strong over a very narrow energy window, and that neutrino interactions with normal matter are, are rare. In 2017, a second publication evaluated events discovered in the intervening 20 years for the ABC prion model. The ABC prion model predicts two deep inelastic scattering ratios, and at high energy, 16 additional predictions are made for, for free prion events. Both the quantitative center of mass value, which is obtainable from the free prion masses of free prions, and the qualitative decay channels are predicted for those 16 predictions. Nine of the 18 results have been found, with the top and the Higgs being two of them. Eight of the nine agree fully with the, with the qualitative and quantitative predictions, while the ninth is within the experimental error bar. Three of the nine can be used to fit the A, B, and C prion masses, while the other six yield very strong support for the theory. The ABC prion model is now getting some attention. A Google search yields thousands of results, and third-party comments are being made on occasion. A classical derivation of Maxwell's equations from a two-component ether was published in 1998. The model essentially assumes two bound infinite Dirac C's of charge, one positive and the other negative. With the postulated incompressibility, Poisson's equation results when some extra ether is immersed in the C. Extra ether comes from energy freeing pieces of the normally bound ether from their bindings in the C's. Using simple flow and tension laws and a resulting negative mass for one of the components, leads to a rigorous vector calculus-based derivation of Maxwell's equations. This is something that Maxwell and others searched for prior to the advent of relativity, but when relativity abandoned the ether as superfluous, serious work on the ether stopped. Presently, I am now working on a derivation of the Lorentz force law, which should be consistent with the ethereal Maxwell equation model. An absolute quantum mechanics paper was published in 2017. The derivation of the equations starts with the empirical relationships E equals h bar omega, P equals h bar k, and the usual high velocity relation linking energy, momentum, mass, and potential energy. From there, a simple proposal of an underlying wave is made. Next, Differentiating the wave expression with respect to time yields a relationship for the energy in terms of the wave function and the time derivative of the wave function. Then, differentiating the wave function with respect to the spatial variables yields a relationship for the momentum in terms of the wave function and the spatial derivatives of the wave function. Those relations can then be substituted into the high-velocity energy formula to yield the new high-velocity quantum mechanics equation, equation 1, as shown here. Here we again see equation 1, which is the exact high-energy absolute quantum mechanics equation. The paper shows how it reduces to the Schrodinger equation in the, in the low energy limit. A version without the potential has been known for a long time. However, because 
because, however, development was abandoned before it really began because the equation has the Laplacian inside the radical and the equation is not covariant. It violates relativity. Yet if we admit the possibility of an absolute theory instead of a relative one, we are okay with it not being covariant. But how do we handle the Laplacian inside of the radical? For stationary states, the potential is a function of the spatial coordinates only and does not involve the time. This allows us to use the separated form for the wave function shown here that separates it into equation 2. Since the left-hand side is only a function of time, while the center portion is only a function of the spatial variables, we can set each of these to a separation constant E sub n. The solution to the temporal equation can be found immediately, as it is the usual solution that is the same as the one for the low-velocity Schrodinger case. Next, we can bring the potential over to the right-hand side and square each side, and then expand the square and multiply through by psi to end up with equation 3. Equation 3 is the complete high-velocity equivalent of the Schrodinger equation for stationary states, and we have achieved our goal of extracting the Laplacian from the radical. As an example use of the new quantum mechanical equation, we can consider the case of the hydrogen atom problem, where the potential consists of the Coulomb potential plus the spin-spin magnetic dipole potential. In this case, equation 3 is the exact, high-velocity and spin-inclusive quantum mechanical equation. There is no need for perturbation theory with the new quantum mechanical equation, although numerical techniques are likely needed to find solutions to the equation. However, note that there is a problem with infinities at the origin, and while one could resort to some sort of renormalization, another approach is to postulate a small finite size to the particles. Such a postulate of a small size would also qualitatively predict the Lamb shift, as the S state has a maximum value where the particle separation goes to zero, while the P state has zero value there, which will lead to an energy shift. But beyond the hydrogen atom, equation 3 may find use for other potential conditions, such as the strong force, where a proper potential may yield the meson mass spectra. The four works just discussed are all based on absolute and realist physics, and such an approach faces a major hurdle today. Modern physics is based on the more recent thinking of Hume, Mach, Einstein, and Bohr, which eludes full human understanding. Modern physics has been used by legions of great minds to arrive at the standard model of today, and modern physics accurately, if complicatedly, also predicts almost all experimental results, and hence it is believed to be a great advance beyond absolute and realist physics. The hurdle is that when we place our belief in something we do not fully understand, and that something passes so many experimental tests, it gets fully entrenched as the only way to do things. But there is another way to do physics besides modern physics. The physics presented here has a simple underpinning and it is amenable to human understanding. It is similar to the more intuitive and natural way that physics was done over 100 years ago. And recall that advances in physics often follow from simplifications. So perhaps we should consider a return to the absolute and realist ways of the past. My son recently graduated in May of 2018 as a physics major. There was no mention in four years of Lorentz's approach to the Lorentz transformation. It's all relativity now. When he asked how Schrodinger found his equation, he was told he was really smart and had a great intuition. Yet, with a slight modification of what we've seen above, a realist derivation is easy. Our students are being educated without the advantage of learning the historical path mankind took to get where we are today. A great struggle of the past is being ignored. Something important is being lost. Hume, Mach, Einstein, and instrumentalism enabled great freedom to do physics without being constrained by an assumed underlying, understandable, objective reality. Principles in mathematics, along with curved and multiple dimensions, are used by modern physics to model the complex results of our experiments. But modern physics may have also taken us away from an actual underlying physical reality of our world. 
if there indeed is such an underlying physical reality. Realism in physics has been set aside as outdated, and Lorentz's absolute space and time is now considered discredited. But what if there is an underlying reality? It is possible that physics made a mistake in the early 1900s. Ironically, the realism championed by Einstein can be recovered if we set Einstein's relativity aside and return to an absolute and realist approach to physics. We may profit should we once again consider the physics approach of models, realism, and a primacy of space and time, as such an approach might be used to answer many of the great unanswered questions of physics today. The ideas expressed in this webinar can be found in more detailed form in the peer-reviewed journal Physics Essays, and references to the peer-reviewed papers are shown here. Kindly, Physics Essays has allowed a reprinting of the articles on my personal site at www.larsonism.com. Or, if you prefer video formats for the presentations, some videos are also available at www.larsonism.com. Lastly, Physics Essays has kindly allowed the published works to appear in online encyclopedias, and the editors of Infogalactic have been supportive of placing these works there. Thank you for your time.